This is the Art of Dental Finance and Management podcast brought to you by Art Wiederman, CPA with Ide Bailey. Whether it's taxes and investing or planning wisely, Art is the expert to make your dental practice profitable. At Ide Bailey, what inspires you inspires us. We provide a suite of accounting and advisory services dedicated to the total care of your practice. Visit our website to access our tools and resources tailored for dentists, idebailey.com slash dentist. That's E-I-D-E-B-A-I-L-L-Y dot com slash dentist. This podcast is distributed with the understanding that Art Wiederman, CPA, and Ide Bailey, LLP are not rendering legal, accounting, or other professional advice. Listeners should consult with their business advisors before acting on any of the information or opinions shared. If you have questions and or feedback, make sure to email Art over at awiederman at idebailey.com. That's A-W-I-E-D-E-R-M-A-N at E-I-D-E-B-A-I-L-L-Y dot com. You can also give Art a call at 657-279-3243. Without further delay, here's your host, Dental CPA, Art Wiederman. And hello, everyone, and welcome to another edition of the Art of Dental Finance and Management with Art Wiederman CPA. I am Art Wiederman CPA, and it's a pleasure to be with you on a beautiful Sunday afternoon here in Southern California. We're going to we're going to date stamp this uh, podcast. Today is uh, Sunday, August the 30th. It's going to come out on the 2nd of September. And the reason we're date stamping it is we're going to we're going to talk to you about some of the stuff that's going on briefly with the PPP program and the HHS program and ESPN and HBO and anything else you want to know about. But we are going to talk today. And my guest is my really good friend and team member from Ide Bailey. Um, Scott Haberman, who's a partner in their office in Fort Collins, Colorado. We're going to talk about some tax planning tips. This is a year that is different than any of the 44 tax filing seasons that I've been involved in. And Scott and I are going to talk to you about uh, what's going on with the um, government programs and and mostly what you should be looking for. Because folks, believe it or not, Tuesday, we will be two thirds of the way through 2020. I know that is impossible to believe. It seems like 2020 has lasted about 10 years for all of us. It's been a real tough year. But uh, again, my my saying is that failure is not an option. And I continue to believe that, continue to hear great stories from dentists about how they're doing. We'll get Scott's take on how his dentists are doing. But first, let me give you some information and some um, some things that are going on. So first of all, um, if you want to get a hold of me in my office in Tustin, California, uh, my number is 657-279-3243. And if you want to get a hold of me uh, on my email, my email is artweederman at gmail.com. Real easy. It's W-I-E-D-E-R-M-A-N. Um, take a look at our partner. We have a wonderful partner that I talk about all the time. It's a, it's a magazine, a clinical magazine called Decisions in Dentistry. Go to their website, www.decisionsanddentistry.com. And if you wanted a free complimentary consultation uh, with you know, one of us or the Academy, uh, Academy of Dental CPA member in your area, um, you can go on there and click a box and we'll get, get a hold of you and do that. But uh, the great thing about uh, Decisions in Dentistry is they have amazing articles and content. Uh, they have a great membership program. If you can go on Go on to their CE page, and if you uh, sign up for an annual subscription membership, it's a very reasonable price. You will have access to more than 140 CE courses. Uh, Again, very reasonable price. Um, uh, Basically, you know, here's a couple of the courses that they do. Um, Toxicity of e-cigarettes on human health. uh, Applications of acupuncture uh, in um, dentistry. And... um, Preservation over prevalence, the importance of interdental cleaning. These are the types of courses that you're going to be able to have access to uh, at Decisions in Dentistry. Go on to our website also, which is www.idebailey, that's E-I-D-E-B-A-I-L-L-Y.com, and you'll be able to see all the most recent podcasts. You can see them on the Decisions website too. Uh, HMWC is the firm that I've been with. And we merged with Ide Bailey a little over a month ago, and it's been a really great partnership. And 
I've gotten to meet wonderful people like Scott Haberman, who you're going to meet in a couple minutes. And the entire team from top to bottom at I'd Bailey is just uh, first class, top notch. Um, one other thing I would like to share with you also is that if you're looking for a dental CPA anywhere in the United States, um, go to our website, which is the www.adcpa.org, 24 CPA firms across the United States that represent 9,000, over 9,000 dentists. And I do want to share one event that is going on that I'd like to publicize. Um, you know, these are my dear friends from back to 20 years. Uh, one of them is uh, Mark Rosen out of Boston. And Mark Mark was on the podcast with BJ Coucher and Bob Gray about uh, two months ago talking about the PPP rules. And uh, Mark has an event coming up, which is to support uh, the virtual New England Parkinson's Ride, which is going to be September the 12th. Uh, it's a fundraiser. And the um, the link he sent to me is really long. I'm not going to read it to you. Uh, I will put it in the show notes. Um, but if you go to fundraise.michaeljfox.org, Michael J. Fox is the um, uh, the comedic actor, and uh, he has had Parkinson's for many years. He's one of their main national spokespeople. And you go to Mark Rosen's page, you can contribute. I would encourage you to do that. I mean, all of our members, I Bailey is an unbelievably charitable organization. Uh, but all of our members, the ADCPA also, people like Mark, who's a dear friend of mine, and um, please support his virtual New England Parkinson's ride, which is uh, September 12th. So today, folks, we're going to talk about tax planning. How exciting is that? Get yourself a glass of vodka or a bottle of wine or whatever your <laughs> beverage of choice is. And my guest today is Scott Haberman. Scott is a partner at Ide Bailey. He's a tax partner. And he works uh, about 80% to 90% of his life is spent working with dentists. And I'm going to let Scott tell you a little bit about his story. But we're going to talk a little bit about the uh, the HHS, what's going on with that, update with that, the PPP. And then what should you be looking at for tax planning? So my good friend, Scott Haberman, how are you doing today? Welcome to the Art of Dental Finance and Management. Thanks for having me, Art. It's great to be here. How's life in Colorado these days? You know, it's uh, we had a nice rainstorm last night with some lightning and double rainbows, and uh, we picked it up today with a nice sunny day. So, so life is good on this Sunday. Oh man, I've been, I spent my first week at the University of Colorado when I was at Deloitte back in 1981, and boy, is that a beautiful place! My aunt lives in Colorado in Littleton. It's just a gorgeous, gorgeous place, isn't yeah. it? It, it's it's wonderful up here. You get all the seasons, and you can go to the high country, lakes, and everywhere in between. It's a really fun place to live. Well, Scott, before we get started talking about the exciting and scintillating and unbelievably just just <laughs> mind blowing topic of tax planning for dentists, uh, tell us a little bit about you and your story and your journey. Sure, sure. So so much like you, Art, I started my career with with Deloitte, uh, actually in their New York City office. Um, and I, I was actually born and raised in Seattle, Washington. So that was my big adventure after college. So went to University of Washington for my undergrad studies in accounting and, and stayed for my master's as well and, uh, and jumped on board with Deloitte. And after about a year with them, I, I had enough of the big four lifestyle and uh, transitioned to a, a regional firm in the Seattle market. Spent about 10 years there and my wife and I had an opportunity to come out to, to Colorado and, and get closer to family who'd been retiring and moving around and and we found a, a great place in Fort Collins and, and I Bailey. So we've been here in Fort Collins for the last five years and, and it's been a fun ride. I, uh, I have some family who introduced me to to serving the, the dental field uh, from from the accounting and tax and finance perspective and uh, that's, it's been a great profession to, to learn and understand and, and really get some of those unbiased views from, from my family members who are in that profession, as well as, uh, as well as my clients who, who are not only, you know, wonderful people to work with, but also really dear friends, uh, probably similar to your, uh, your clients that you've been working with over the last, uh, 30 or 40 years. It's amazing. Dentists are some of the finest human beings that I've ever met. And what's really interesting, Scott, is when you talk to a dentist, and and I've had the ability to you know to refer some patients to dentists in different areas of Southern California because a lot of the people in my 
world know that I'm a dental CPA? And they said, well, can you refer me to a dentist? And when, when I refer them, it's unbelievable. They, they, they turn on a switch and it's like, you yeah, know, they want to know about them and what are their issues and we're going to take really good care of them. These are some of the kindest, most, um, you know, outgoing and caring people I've, I've, I've ever met. So oh, no. they have had a tough time. So how are your dentists doing in your, in your group? How have they been doing? I mean, obviously March 16th, they were not right. doing very well, but, right. uh, how have they come out of the pandemic? You know, I, I think those first two months were obviously pretty rough with all the uncertainty. Everyone was trying to figure out, you know, what's what's going to happen the next day. Uh, but as soon as offices started opening up, I, I think that all all of my clients, uh, they all had a great response from their patients, ready to get back in, ready to get uh, the wheels turning in the practice again. Most of the staff uh, have been very positive and, and ready to get back to work. and and are excited to be there, even in my own dental office. I went in for a procedure about a month ago, and and everyone was very positive, and it was clean and organized, and just a well-run operation. And and they've been having some of the greatest months of their office's history. So I think it's been anywhere from, uh, you know, 80% of typical collections that's on the low side to uh, you know 110, 120%. Uh, from their historical monthly collection. So it's been a great, a great pickup and a great run um, since the reopening. You know, my, my concern is, okay, what are we doing to fill those gaps? And those are the conversations I'm having during my tax planning conversations of, you know, how's your October looking? How's November and the rest of the year? Um, I think it's, it's pretty imperative to keep your eye on the ball and, and making sure that you, you have that full schedule, but enough flexibility for, for any kind of exams or procedures. Um, but I think it's been a great response, uh, since, since those June and May reopenings. How about I, yours, Art? Yeah. I mean, we, we've had a, most of our clients have done really well and I'm a little worried about the fourth quarter lull, um, you know, making sure, um, as I've mentioned before, one of our guests in a prior podcast, my good friend, Joanne Tanner, who's a consultant was, you know, telling our listeners to take a look at all of your patients and see who has not been in for their two, um, uh, two profies that are covered by insurance and give them a call. Even if they came in in September, say, listen, you got one more. Why don't you come in in December? Let's just make sure everything is okay. And uh, several of my clients have taken me up on that, but it's really about getting into the weeds, managing. And, and folks, let me again, emphasize Marketing is so important. The day you stop marketing the business is the day uh, your business starts to die. And mm -hmm. so you want to be you know, prevalent on social media. We had Leonard, Leonard Tao on our podcast a couple of weeks ago talking about um, social media marketing and the importance of five-star Google reviews. And don't get me started. I'll get started on them. This will become a marketing <laughs> podcast. And Scott, you won't be able to say a word. But anyway, we won't do that to you. <laughs> so let, let's get into some of these topics. Let's start off with... Um, uh, where where is Congress right now, Scott? Um, uh, <laughs> Aren't they on recess? They're still they're on, on re uh, yeah. They're on recess. They should be in timeout. They shouldn't be in <laughs> recess. They should be in timeout, and they should be left in timeout for six months. No, um, they are on recess until uh, probably next week after Labor Day. Labor Day is a a week from tomorrow, so they'll be back the week of the. Um, I guess that'd be the week of, the week of uh, September seventh, right? Yeah, 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 yeah. They got it. They have some things to do, some things to take care of when they get back. Yeah. So I, I talked to uh, my, I call her jokingly and lovingly my roving reporter Megan Mortimer, who's the congressional uh, lobbyist for the American Dental Association, who has been uh, my, who's become a very good friend. I've never met her face to face. She is, she lives three thousand miles away from me in Washington D.C. She's living and breathing the Beltway every single day. So here's what she told me, Scott. She told me that she actually had a conversation with several congressmen, uh, one of them being the um, uh, the chairman of the House Ways and Means Committee. Mm. And what they said was this. They said there is significant, um, you know, bipartisan support for three things. Number one, anybody who has a PPP loan that is under $150,000, which is the majority of our dentists, um, would be able to, if this law is passed, sign a one-page attestation that says, uh, I solemnly swear that I followed the rules, now leave me alone. That's basically what it's going to say. And you will be able to not send any information to the bank. The banking industry is pushing hard for this. Because think about it, Scott, they got 5 million PPP loans are out there. 
five mm-hmm. million. That's mm-hmm. five million uh, underwriting touches that the banking industry has to have. Mm-hmm. So we hope that's going to happen, right? Oh, oh, totally, absolutely, Art. I, I think all of my clients would would love to take their time and spend it better elsewhere. And I think that you know we as advisors would like to spend our time elsewhere too to um, give more guidance on areas that could help their practice grow um, rather than some of these compliance exercises that is is pretty much uh, behind this forgiveness application. Yeah, and and, and folks do watch uh, our website. Um, you know, it's amazing. I, I I like Scott started my career at Deloitte it, when I'm a I, I'm one of the gray hairs. Scott is not, um, but um, I started my career in 1981 with Deloitte Haskins and Cells is what it was called. Um, and, uh, you know, back then there was no Internet. Uh, we had Pong and Pac-Man. That was about it. Um, and, um, you know, being with a big firm uh, has uh, I've kind of come full circle. I was with Deloitte and then I had my own firm for 33 years with my dear friend Pam Chamberlain. And then I merged with um, HMWC, which was a 45 person firm that became a 90 person firm. And then last month we merged with Ide Bailey, which is a firm that has 40 offices and about 2,500 people. But the resources that this firm have are frightening. Um, The one thing I did forget to mention folks, by the way, on September 16th, do not forget to listen to the podcast. And it basically is, um, um, it basically is, um, going to be on the research and development tax credit. Okay. And the research and development tax credit is a credit that we are seeing is going to be available for dentists. So what I want you to do is, um, go onto our website and go to www.idbailey.com forward slash dental RD. And you can fill out a questionnaire with about, um, uh, it'll take you 10 or 15 minutes. And what will happen is, is that uh, we'll get back to you and see if you you can uh, be subject to this credit. Now, Scott, I know you've done some of that, right? Oh, yes, uh, absolutely. All, all of the tax planning calls I've been having with my clients over the past month and a half, um, we all go through the rundown of how, how I approach these. But this R&D tax credit, you know, it hasn't really been recognized previously uh, for, for this industry. And and we saw some opportunity here, and and as a firm, we're, we've been discussing this a lot with our our dental industry, and I think it's a, a great opportunity to reduce your your tax liability not all not only for your federal credit, but also for you, Art California. I, I believe they have a pretty hefty credit out there that it, might even be more valuable than the, the it, IRS. It is. It's big. One. It's bigger than the state one, uh, and again, it just depends on the state that you're in. You know, if you're a uh, if you're listening and you've got an ADCPA member firm, check with your ADCPA uh, uh, CPA and they'll know about it. Scott knows about it. We'll let Scott give out his information here in a little bit. But again, go onto our website, www.idbailey.com forward slash dental, D-E-N-T-A-L-R-D. And you can basically fill this out, click a button, and then uh, our R&D team headed up by Joe Stoddart and Heidi Lannon, who you will hear in a couple of weeks. Uh, they're, they're amazing. Uh, they actually got one of my clients and, and we can go back and amend 17 and 18 tax returns and 19, if you've done them, um, we got a client over $400,000 in tax credits. It's pretty, pretty cool deal. Okay. So we talked about the PPP. Let's chat briefly about HHS and then we'll get into tax planning. So, um, as you all know, the department of health and human services, uh, through the cares act had, has this, uh, fund called the HHS Provider Relief Fund. It was $175 billion that was made a part of the CARES Act uh, back in March. And it wasn't opened up until the dental profession until July. So now all dentists are eligible. I'm not gonna get into lots and lots of details, but I'm gonna give you some updates. And uh, you know, we did a, a great webinar and I think that's gonna be posted up on our website uh, either Monday or Tuesday. And we can get you the link for that. But couple of things to note. Number one, if you have not applied for the HHS, Scott, I think it's now September 13th. Yep. It was Friday, August 30, 20, excuse me, August 28th, uh, a couple of days ago. And then it got kicked, uh, the can got kicked down the road to September 13th. So we have another two weeks. So what are you telling your clients about applying for this relief? 
I'm letting them know that, you know, it's, uh, it's a good source of additional uh, income. You know, it is, it is called a grant, but it is taxable income, just like collections. And so be aware of that. Um, it's 2% of your revenues from your most recently filed tax return. So most likely your 2019 filing. Um, but, you know, it does come with some, screen, some strings attached. And some of those are like the PPP, uh, how much you receive from these HHS funds will be public knowledge. And uh, the concern there is uh, some folks could look up and see what's your average annual collections. Uh, so that's that's one of the items that you need to be aware of. And the second is there will be some disclosures that you need to provide to HHS um, after the fact. So later this year, which I think Art might mention briefly in a bit um, oh, yeah. about what did you use your, your funds uh, for, you know, what kind of expenses and, and so forth. Uh, but it is it's a good um, you know, lifeline for some additional income and cash. And um, I, I don't see any reason why not to apply for it at this point in time. So the way this works is that it is generally approximately 2% of your gross revenues. Um, I have had some clients, Scott, that have gotten more than 2%. Mm. I had a doctor who did about 1.6 million. He got 37,000. So, you know, everything is relative. Uh, they may not be, you know, they didn't get the math right or they have some other formulas, but there's a couple of things you need to know. Number one, um, this, these funds need to be used to fight COVID-19. So the easy way, and, and, and here's the really good thing that I just learned this, is that you are allowed to use these funds, even if you didn't get them. Most of our dentists, Scott, didn't get these till July or August. But you can use these funds pretty much for anything you spent. They say after January 1, but I would make it after March 16th. So uh, for anything you spent to make your office safe for your patients, not that it wasn't safe, but to do everything that everybody had to do. So for example, most of our doctors, and I'm sure yours did too, Scott, they spent money on, um, you know, uh, air filtering and air conditioning systems and UV uh, lighting, you know, the things that click on and off that uh, take all the particles out of the air and suction machines. I had, was in my dentist's office. Uh, the hygienist was, uh, my hygienist was showing me the suction machine that is specifically, uh, you know, intended to keep the particles out of the air. Um, the the partitions, when you walk into a dental office, the, the plexiglass partitions that you put up uh, and all the PPE that you had to buy. If you got all that stuff from March 16th until you opened your office, maybe in June, you know, May or June, uh, you are allowed to claim those expenditures, even though you didn't get the HHS funds until after you spent that money. And many of you have spent enough money um, to already be done. Now, they were supposed to come out with reporting requirements on the 17th. They did not of August. They did not, of course, in the rule of government. It's, uh, you know, it, it's like my golf score. All go <laughs> my golf score is like, my, you know, <laughs> all all golf scores of Art Wiederman are quoted approximately. All laws of the government are quoted <laughs> approximately. Right, Scott? You know, it, it's crazy. And and so they have not come out with these rules. Um, you are not supposed to buy anything from any a vendor that is on the government's bad list. So you might ask that, but most of you should, and, and you can use this money for PPE. And then they say you can use it to replace lost revenues. Very confusing. But what we think that means is that for eight to 12 weeks, you had no revenues, but you had expenses. You had to pay, um, you know, not things that you paid PP, uh, PPP for, not wages, not rent, not utilities, not interest, but you had, you know, repairs, you had uh, office expense, uh, you had, uh, you know, supplies, you had lab bills, all those expenditures we believe are going to be covered. We're waiting for guidance from them. But we think, and I agree with Scott, that, that you should apply for this. You need to read the terms and conditions. Um, but you know what? You got till September 13th. It's 2% of your revenue. So most of, for most of you, you have a million dollar practice. It's 20,000 bucks. Think of it as a big, a big case that you're doing. Maybe uh, two quadrants of um, you know, crowns or implants um, that uh, you don't have any lab, you don't have any expend, uh, any, any supplies. And instead of having to drill on a patient, you just have to punch some numbers into a computer. That's kind of the way we think about it. So 
Anything else on HHS, Scott, we should be thinking about? No, that was a great summary, Art. Okay. All right. So let's now start talking about tax planning, which is what I want to spend the rest of the episode talking about. Scott, talk about how you are approaching tax planning for 2020. I mean, it is completely a different animal than any other year we've dealt with. Yeah. Yeah. It's totally a year like like no other out there. Um, and, and much like probably your client base when you're serving them from the tax planning perspective, you know, most of them have growth each year and, and their income, you know, keeps going up uh, with inflation at least uh, as long as their practice is growing uh, over the years. Uh, but it's, it's pretty easy, you know, to have those conversations and go through your, your bullet point list of, you know, are you doing this strategy? Are you doing that to keep your liability as low as it could be? Um, and, and here's what your tax em- estimate is looking like uh, come April of 2021 if you're making your quarterly payments. Um, but but now we have two months of uh, closed doors. We have PPP forgiveness that could be deductible. It might not be. Um, we have HHS funds that might spike uh, your income for one month. Are we pulling that out to see, okay, what's our annualized income looking like? So there's a lot of a lot of moving parts this year that uh, you kind of have to run through multiple scenarios uh, with your with your CPA and really know okay you know what's the best case scenario uh, depending on what Congress does what's what's worst case scenario so I think you got to look at it uh, from multiple points of view and and that's just not something that we've had to do in the past with uh, uncertainty of you know, we're in a plane and the, the as you mentioned before, Art, the plane is still being built when it's in the air. Um, yeah. And so I think we're still at that point when we, we need that clear guidance. Well, so so let's take an example, Scott. So I have a doctor who's doing a million dollars a year. Uh, maybe they net, let's say, say they net 350. Uh, you as their CPA are recommending a salary. And this is a typical scenario, maybe a salary of, uh, uh, you know, two hundred fifty thousand, and they're going to take distributions of two hundred. Is that a reasonable, you know, something that you see in your practice? Yeah, yeah, I always have that reasonable compensation uh, discussion with uh, my my docs, and you know, there is there is no uh, there is no exact number out there. It's 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 a term of art, and that term of art is something that the IRS uses if they were ever to come and say, hey, let me know what your wage you're paying yourself is. You have these distributions, you have this profit. Well, why is your wage this? And they'll they'll essentially tell you what your your salary should be, and that amount is based upon your uh, your your geographic region of the country, the the services that you perform, your um, the profits of your practice, and so forth. So there's a lot of moving parts there. I think a good way to hedge your 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 risk is okay. What would you pay someone? in a position if you were to hire them unrelated to you, so not a family member, but if you were to hire someone from uh, a, a, a headhunter that you might have found an associate for, how much would you pay them to perform the same procedures? I think that's a good rule of thumb. And there's also um, some folks talk about the social security wage base, about 138,000, I think it is for 2020, give or take a couple thousand dollars. That's also, I think uh, a minimum salary that some folks will pay themselves, but uh, that's usually a conversation we have during those tax planning meetings each year. Yeah, those are those are really great points. Got a couple of things I want to bring up. Number one, doctors, if you're an S corporation, make sure you take a reasonable salary. If you have a million dollar practice and you have a three hundred thousand dollar bottom line K one and no salary, uh, you're asking for a whooping. <laughs> you're you're gonna mm-hmm. they're gonna come and get you. In fact, when you get your approval to become an S corporation. It flat out says on the approval form from the IRS, you will take a reasonable salary. You will do this. You will not pass go. You will not collect $200. That's just kind of how it works. That's, this is what you need to do. And um, so that that's one thing. Another thing to think about here is, um, so, so from a salary standpoint, Scott, number one, if we're gonna put money into a retirement plan, we, you know, if we take fifty thousand dollars in salary, we're not going to be able. Number one, it may not be reasonable. Number two, that's going to cause a problem for how much money we can put in a pension plan, right? Right, right. Any kind of profit sharing that you have linked in with your four hundred and one k or employee match. It, there's a lot of factors that you need to discuss with your CPA or us um, and your retirement plan advisor of what's the right salary we need to have for ourselves, our employees, 
Is your spouse on staff? Do we need to look at increasing that spouse's salary? So there's a lot of moving parts. And again, if you own your building, maybe a way to hedge your bets from a, a low salary is increasing your rent to a market rate. Maybe your rent's pretty low and we can reduce the profit of the practice and increase the, the profit of the, that self-rental. Yeah. So I think there's a lot of different uh, moving parts that you just got to go through with, with your tax planner and advisor um, to make sure that you're in the best spot possible. Okay. And, and the other thing we've got is we've got this this section 199A deduction mm-hmm. that, you know, it's kind of a double-edged sword. You know, the the the, the smaller, I mean, the, the bigger our K-1 is and the less salary we take, uh, if our income for married filing joint is under about $420,000, $425,000, um, we get this uh, 20, nice 20% deduction. It's a great deduction. It's a, it's a phantom deduction. Uh, quote unquote, uh, so you don't have to spend a dollar to get it. Um, it was introduced with uh, the Tax Reform Act that was passed at the end of 2017. So it's only been around for 18, 19, and, and now 20. It's going to expire, I think, at 2025. Um, but of course, that could change uh, next year, depending on who's in office. Uh, so that could uh, be rolled back. But that's a great a great opportunity. But again, like Art said, for our profession, CPAs, attorneys, uh, dentists, doctors, other specified services that the IRS said are are not eligible for the full deduction if you're over a certain income threshold, um, we really have to focus on keeping your income within a certain point if you have a practice uh, that you know you, you might be in this income range. So it's something to focus on. Now, sure. I, I also want to throw something else out, Scott, which I think is very important. So in about, I believe it was 60, 65 days, we have an election. And again, as everybody knows, I, I did get an email from somebody that said, even though, Art, you say you're not political, you're talking political. I am not. <laughs> I am absolutely not talking politics. We're Nothing talking good. What's that? We're, We're talking, talking tax, tax not, folks. Not so here, here's, here's the facts. Our government has gone two point, um, you know, Two, $2.2 trillion into debt. They're going to go more. It's going to be three to five trillion, which is a, a, an un, unbelievable number if you think about it. I mean, one or two or three isn't the big number, but when you put a trillion behind it, uh, I mean, that, that's that's a lot of zeros. Oh, rewind, so, rewind 11 years. You remember the the bank bailout? Uh, what was that? 800 billion 800 or so? Billion. And that was, yeah. that was mind-blowing. And now we're here and it doesn't well, really... Uh, make the headlines these days. Well, if it may, you know, Scott, I'm old enough to remember this. In 1981, <laughs> when Ronald Reagan became the president and Jimmy Carter left office, I think I got my presidents right. The national debt in this country was $900 billion. When we get done with 2020, our national be- debt will be somewhere between 25 and $27 trillion. Wow. It, it's pretty frightening. So the, the reason I say that is think about it this way, folks. What's happening in our government, okay? I mean, in our society. Businesses are opening up, but there's lots of businesses that are not opening up. Um, 15% of all restaurants have closed. 10% more are going to close. We also have, um, you know, we had the $600 kicker, Scott, uh, for the unemployment. That's gone. It's not coming back to 600. It may be 200 or 300 or whatever the, uh, the brain surgeons in Washington come up with but it's going to be less. So the bottom line is there's going to be less tax revenue. Businesses have made less money. Individuals have made less money. 30 30 million people went on unemployment. The bottom line is our government needs money. So here's, here's how this is going to work quite frankly. And this is, this is not, a uh, you know, (laughs) this is the history of our country. If we have, if Joe Biden wins the white house, and if the Senate flips Democratic, I can guarantee you your taxes are going to go up. That is not a commentary. That is what they they have said, is taxes are going to go up on the high-income earners, on people making two, three, four, five hundred thousand dollars $500,000. They have to. Um, if, if that does not happen, uh, if we do have, uh, if President Trump is reelected, uh, if the House the House is going to stay Republican because they got about a 35 seat edge, if the Senate Scott um, you know stays, then uh, everything will probably stay the same. So uh, 
I would think on November 4th, you and I are going to be making a lot of phone calls. Do you think? Oh, yeah. Yeah, there's a lot that's changing. And and if we, if the Democrats get the majority, I mean, do you remember Obamacare when it passed a number of years ago? That No one thought anything like that could pass. And, and yet uh, it seemed like it went through uh, without a hitch. And so I think anything can happen when a party can get a majority of, of, of most houses. So the reason I bring this up again, honest to goodness, folks, just make sure the one thing I will tell you, just go out and make sure you vote. Whoever you vote for is 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 your choice. My point is, is that you have about two months once the election is over to make some moves. So if we think the tax rates are going to go up in 2021, then what do you want to do, Scott? We want to accelerate income into 2020 and defer deductions, yeah. maybe? Yeah, yeah. And I, I think that kind of goes a hand in hand with depreciation planning. If if you're making some large equipment purchases this year, and a lot of my clients are actually buying practices. They might be buying their second or third practice this year, maybe a yep. building because the dentist is leaving town. They're they're over it and they're, they're retiring and they want to move away and, and, and call it a career. And so, you know, there's certain things that you have to consider that are opposite of of your thought process last year of, oh, you, you bought this piece of equipment, let's take 100% bonus or 179 it. Um, I think we got to take a more critical look of let's let's slow this down. If, you know, maybe we don't want to eat into these lower tax brackets that we're in right now, let's save it for next year. And so, you know, you don't have to make that decision in 2020 for the 2020 tax year. I mean, you can make those depreciation decisions, um, you know, after the fact in 2021. And so, um, there's a lot of things that you can do right now, but you can still do a, a number of things uh, next year as well. And and there's going to be a lot of moving parts, but hopefully we get some more clarity in the next few weeks with a CARES 2.0 Act uh, that shed some light on this PPP uh, non-deductibility issue. So let's talk about that for a second. So folks, if you are doing your own QuickBooks accounting and maybe you don't send it more than once a year and you're looking and saying, you know, Wow, my income is way down. Scott, this is very important. This might be the most important thing that you and I talk about in this entire podcast. When a dentist or any business owner looks at their financial statements right now, more than likely they will have put on their books, let's say they got a loan for $100,000 for PPP, okay? Make yeah. it an easy numbers. It's Sunday afternoon. I've been in the sun. Oh, man, I hit this five wood today right over the stick. It was just, uh, this is nothing to do with taxes. I'm sorry. <laughs> it's all about golf folks, as you know, and that's all that matters with me anyway. So you got a hundred thousand dollar PPP loan, right? And yeah. you look at your numbers and you say, wow, okay. I, uh, I got, I've got all this, uh, you know, my, my income's down 40%. I'm, I've, I was closed and I'm not coming. Yeah. I'm coming back a little bit, but I'm down. I won't have a problem with taxes, but remember Scott, that $100,000, they've probably already spent on wages and rent and utilities and interest. And at this moment, that is not tax deductible, right? Right, right. Totally. And and, and, and if you're looking at, say, uh, 150000 of net income, maybe year to date through August, um, but you have that $100,000 loan that you're going to seek forgiveness on right now, that $100,000 is non-deductible if it's all forgiven. And so, even though your $150,000 of uh, net income at this time of the year uh, is showing us so in your financial statements, well, you're currently you're going to be taxed on $250,000 because of that forgiven uh, loan. And so that's going to catch a lot of folks off guard. And that's where we really need to have those conversations uh, running those two scenarios, because I think it is fluid. I think it is really a 50-50 chance of it uh, being deductible again. And so we really need to to plan for the worst case scenario, which is uh, it's non-deductible right now, but still know, okay, well, here it is if it's if it is deductible. Exactly. So Scott, you by the way, you work with several, you know, you work with large groups of of people that own a lot of practices, right? Yeah, we do. We do. We we work with a, a number of folks and they have some some very large PPP loans. And so those are translating into some large dollars. Um, but luckily there are some things we can do to keep their tax liability down. Um, that we'll we'll touch on a little bit uh, a little bit later here. All right, why don't you quickly give out your contact information uh, if anybody wants to call Scott and have any questions about any of this fun wonderful stuff? 
Um, if you call Scott, Scott requires that you do have a glass of wine or bourbon or whatever in your hand. Uh, he won't talk to you otherwise. Isn't that right, Scott? <laughs> that's right. It's better that way. It's, it's better much that better way. that way. That's right. And, <laughs> that's right. Yeah. And, and if you go, you know, go to Colorado and you're, you're what, 5,000 feet up in the air, nobody will know anyway. So that's how do they right. get a hold? How do folks get a hold of you? Uh, so my phone number is 970 999 eight nine three two and my email is s haberman so s h a b as in boy e r m a n at ide bailey.com e i d e b a i l l y dot com so feel free to give me a shot or shoot me an email happy to have a conversation sounds good let's talk about funding retirement plans now i know that my clients are looking at me and i'm going so you're going to fund a retirement plan for 2020 and they're going are you insane are you new, Art? Have you been seeing what's going on? There's a pandemic going on out there. But, you know, if you if you think about it, a lot of our doctors have come back. I mean, not 100%, but some of them are doing 120, 130% of what they were doing pre-pandemic. And, and they may only be down a month's worth of revenues and they've got PPP money to pay expenses and maybe they have idle money and maybe they're getting this HHS. So a lot of my doctors are not, as badly bad off as they were. Mm -hmm. So um, what do you tell people as far as funding retirement for 2020? So I think it's something to look at, uh, especially if you don't have a retirement plan set up yet. I think you need to seriously consider, okay, we have these deadlines coming up. I believe there's one in October and there's one at the end of the year, depending on what kind of plan that you have uh, that you're going to put in place. But again, it's not something to jump on immediately. I mean, if you want to wait a month or so, uh, it's probably okay. Uh, but but still, if you have the cash flow and the money in the bank account, and most of my clients do, uh, as you said, from the HHS and IDLE and PPP, um, so you have your operating cash, it'd be a little bit higher than usual. Um, let's look at potentially either setting up a retirement plan or or maybe you're thinking about changing one if you're expanding your practice. So I, I think that's got to be a topic of conversation, even though tax rates are going to go up and you know maybe the deduction isn't worth it as much this year as it might be next year, uh, depending on what happens with uh, the next president. Uh, I, I think it's something that you need to look at to keep building up, uh, building up your retirement and uh, lowering your tax liability. And, you know, I think a big, big focus of that retirement plan deduction is maybe it can get you into that uh, that tax bracket where you can catch that 20% deduction. So you get a double benefit there, not only the tax deduction, but also the tax deduction from the retirement plan, but also that 20% QBI, qualified business income deduction. So that it's a pretty powerful tool uh, to lower your liability using retirement plans. That, that's a really great point. And I want to I wanna reemphasize this, especially if, if I have a doctor who's maybe Two to four years out, maybe you're at the top of your game. Now, obviously, it's hard for me to say anybody's at the top of their game in 2020, but, but you know, assuming that, that everything comes back uh, to where it was, and again, the dental profession has done better than most industries have done and most professions have done. So if you set up a defined benefit pension plan three, four years out, you can start funding. I have a doctor, Scott, a specialist. We knew he was selling in three years. So what we did is we set up a DB plan. He was... 65 at the time. And we put 155,000 in each year for three years, because that's what he was comfortable with. And we worked with the TPA, which is the third party administrator. Um, we worked with the TPA. And basically what we ended up doing is we ended up putting about $350,000 in, in the year that he sold. So we got almost $700,000 into his plan over uh, a four year period. And he was a very, very happy camper. So that's something to look at if you're, and with these new cash balance plans, Scott, you mm -hmm. can start, I got doctors starting when they're 40 years old with a cash balance plan. I mean, it's mm -hmm. pretty cool, huh? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. And, and the thing I think what people don't want to do is, you know, they don't want to uh, have these hefty liabilities for their whole staff. Well, I think you got to do the analysis of, well, who would you rather pay, your staff or the IRS? Exactly. And so you have that conversation. And, and I think once you tell them that and, and show them the numbers, it, it makes perfect sense. Uh, you know, I'd rather pay my hygiene team than than Uncle Sam. And yeah. uh, I think I think most uh, business owners would prefer to do that. Now, one other thing that we need to point out, and I want to be very clear on this because it's an important distinction. Uh, 
in the CARES Act, Congress suspended your need to take a required minimum distribution, we call it an RMD, for 2020. But folks, that is only for IRAs and profit sharing plans. So if you have a defined benefit pension plan, please listen to this. You cannot avoid taking your R&D in 20, RMD in 2020. So you have to take that out if you have a defined benefit. If you have a defined contribution, money purchase, nobody has money purchase anymore, but but if you did, um, and an IRA, you have you can avoid taking out your RMD for 2020. Now, if your income is weighed down, you might actually want to take it out because you are going to be in these low tax brackets. Now, remember, folks, you know your taxable income of between is between 160 and 200 and 320 thousand as a married couple. That's 24 percent. I don't remember Scott rates that low. I mean, the rates mm-hmm. are as low as they're ever going to be. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, so so that that's something uh, else to be to be thinking about. Um, talk about cars. I mean, I, I know, Scott, if, you're, if your clients are like mine, all my clients want to write off like 738% of their car. Um, <laughs> you know, our, I, my, car is, my car is over 6,000 pounds. Okay, you're sure about that? Well, it looks pretty heavy, so it must be over 6,000 pounds, right? <laughs> I can't lift it myself, so it must I can't be 6,000 pounds. Exactly, right? <laughs> I need my six-foot, six-inch uh, banker kit. I have to have one of those to lift it up for me. So um, talk, w- w- what's your opinion about cars? I mean, how do you talk to the clients about cars? Yeah, I, I agree that you know anybody anybody out there wants to pay the lowest uh, liability to federal and state uh, governments. So, you know, you don't blame anybody for, for exploring all the options, uh, but for the cars. So, so here's that the rules. So if, if you're driving from your house to your dental practice, you have one practice, you make your money in the chair. Um, you have an office within your dental practice where you review your finances, which most, most practices do have a little closet, uh, where folks can go uh, uh, look at charts and do numbers and so forth. You know, that's called commuting time. So that's like me and Art going to you know, our respective offices from our home uh, when we actually can go back to the offices someday. Uh, when we drive to that office, that's called commuting time. Uh, but you know, here's the thing. What if you have two offices and you're not really practicing um, in the chair each each day. Maybe you're managing, you know, a team of associates and and hygiene staff, and and you have a, a a dedicated office within your house, and you're really managing those practices from your house. Well, you know, your 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 house is your your home office, and so every time you leave your house, that's not commuting time when you're going to those offices. That's business use time for your vehicle. Yep. And so I think when you have a multiple office location, that's a pretty slam dunk case of I can write off my car. But but you know, where do you make your money? Where do you perform your services? If, if it's in the if it's in the exam room, then I mean, boom, that's that, that's hard to uh, argue with the IRS that all of my vehicle driving time is is business use because you might just be going from your home to your to your clinic each day. Uh, but, you know, if you're driving to a CE event or the, to the airport for a CE event or driving to get supplies uh, after work. So that is business use driving time. So it's a case by case scenario. Um, and, and I think you got to talk through the facts with your clients uh, to see if it's an option. Now, if you do have a car that if you do purchase a car, uh, they did with the tax reform act of 2017, raise the depreciation. I think it's about 10,000 in the first year, 16,000 in the second year, and then it drops back down if I remember the numbers correctly. But if your car is over 6,000 pounds um, ground vehicle weight, um, and it and by the way, you can find that out by looking on the driver's door. There is a, there's always a, a, like a, a, a thing on the driver's door that will tell you what this is. Um, GV, GWVR, I believe is what the term is because there's ground vehicle weight and there's ground GVWR. Um, again, it's just too many letters. I do numbers. I do letters. <laughs> anyway, the bottom line is you can look up and see, uh, there are lists on the internet that'll tell you which cars qualify. If those cars qualify, then you, that car qualifies for what's called 100% 
bonus depreciation. Scott, talk about bonus depreciation. That's a pretty cool deal, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. So bonus, I think it came around when we had uh, the the Great Recession. Maybe it was around before that. I think there was a there was some of that around 9/11 when the economy was hitting some speed bumps in 2002 and 2003. But uh, 100% bonus depreciation has come and gone a few times over the last 10 years. Um, but for that, it's, it's separate from that 179 deduction that most folks will talk about. So bonus depreciation is a lot more flexible, um, especially now because you can use it for new equipment or used equipment. And uh, it can even, if you have, say, $150,000 worth of equipment purchases this year and your, your business income is only $100,000, well, that $150,000 uh, equipment purchase, uh, if you take 100% bonus on it, you can create what's called a net op- operating loss and use that net operating loss to carry back and pick up some of your prior year taxable income and get an immediate refund. And so that change is part of the CARES Act too. And so bonus appreciation is much more powerful than that 179 deduction because you don't have to have taxable income to use all of that bonus. Um, but it is it is kind of similar where you can take um, immediate expensing of equipment, uh, similar to that 179, but just a lot more flexible. And, and for those, and, and you're right. And for those doctors, for those of you out there, maybe you own two, three, four, five offices. Your income, maybe it was a million dollars last year in 2019, and maybe you're down to six or seven hundred thousand dollars because of the pandemic. You're still in the maximum tax bracket, so you mm-hmm. still want to take make those moves. Talk about um, so so so. Let I want to finish up with the you know just reemphasizing, folks. You know, look at your PPP numbers. If you got a hundred, one hundred fifty thousand dollars, you've got to add that back. Uh, we could have a twenty five thousand dollar tax credit for PPE. That has also got bipartisan support. Megan says that could happen, but again, you know, we just don't know. We'll know. We will know by the end of September because they won't be around in October. They're going to be. You know, I don't know what campaigning looks like in 2020, but they're going to be working on their campaigns. Um, so whatever's going to happen is going to happen in September. And a couple other things, Scott, that we want to talk about. And, and the most important thing, folks, is if you haven't spoken to your CPA, uh, whether it's Scott or me or my partners at the office, Don Watson, Pam Chamberlain, Sam Williams, a member of the Academy, uh, if you haven't talked and talk, if you haven't talked, if you haven't spoken to your CPA, pick up the phone and say, "Hey, Scott, Art, I uh, haven't talked to you this year, and you know we, we've been reaching out to people. Um, you know, should we talk earlier? Because we want to we want to make sure that you know where you stand." Uh, one other thing I want to touch on is um, there was this provision of the CARES Act that also came in uh, that got rid of what's called um, the QIP problem. So mm-hmm. what happened was, folks, is back uh, you know several years ago, uh, we have this category called qualified improvement property. And basically what that is is when you build out a dental office, qualified improvement property is basically uh, the partitions, the walls, the ceiling tiles, the carpet, the internal makings of your office that are not structural components, structural components, plumbing and electrical inside the walls. So they, they had this technical error that they did never fixed. And the Republicans wanted to fix it, and the Democrats didn't want to fix it. And then, the, then they didn't fix it. Well, they finally fixed it. And what that means is that if you have a bunch of those um, uh, qualified improvement property, you know, the internal, you built out a dental office and you spent two hundred, three hundred thousand dollars, you might be depreciating that over thirty nine years. Scott, we can go back and file an amended return for that, can't we? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Either amended return, or I think you can do a change in accounting method. Oh yeah, we which could, could, we could get do you a, a big we catch do a up 481A. now. Yep, yeah. We can. Yeah, I am required to speak Internal Revenue Code section <laughs> by law, member FDIC. Anyway, so um, but the other thing is a co- talk about a cost segregation study. And, and for those of you, I I, I had a guest um, years ago, years ago, two years ago. <laughs> We've been doing this podcast almost two years now. Um, and, um, uh, my friend, Kurt Gautro in, uh, Louisiana, Louisiana. And, and by the way, since I mentioned it, God bless those of you on the Louisiana and Texas coast, uh, who are affected by the unbelievably 
uh, devastating Hurricane Laura. Uh, God bless all of you, Lake Charles and all those outlying cities. Um, you know, please know that we're all thinking about you. Uh, the, uh, the, the fact of the matter is, is that we have this thing called a cost segregation study. Talk about that for a little bit. Yeah. Yeah. So this goes hand in hand with those planning conversations. I, I think at least, uh, a dozen of my clients have bought, uh, a new office and maybe they were renting before and leasing that, that space for a number of years, but have found a, a, a deal down the street and, and are wanting to move, uh, spaces. Well, a cost segregation study. If uh, actually, let's 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 rewind. So, if you buy a building and you place it into service, you're required to depreciate that building uh, if it's for commercial use over 39 years. And so, you know, that million dollar purchase that you made uh, this year for the building, you're going to get that deduction over 39 years. But here's the thing: our you know, a, a dollar in your pocket today is worth way more than a dollar in your pocket 39 years from now, right? Right, um, right. That's that's time value money, and and who knows if we'll be around 39 years. So um, that there's would a lot be, of different I would be, I would be, <laughs> Scott, I would be 100 years old. I, I want to be, I want to be, remember, I don't know if you guys remember Willard Scott from the Today Show. I want to be one of these guys that's like, okay, yeah, Art Wiederman, is lives in Laguna Hill, Laguna Beach, California. He's 100 today. He's been doing taxes for like 97 <laughs> years. What do you think? You think that would go over? You're around when taxes were created. Yeah, the, I the was. Shuckers, I was around. Yes, shuckers. 1912. Teddy Roosevelt and I were best friends. Absolutely. <laughs> Got to pay for that Civil War somehow, right? That's right. <laughs> All right. Talk so, about cost segregation. Let's not get so off the cost of segregation topic study. So what it comes down to is that time value of money play. So when do you want to get that deduction? Well. Uh, your tax rate's high that right now. You're taxed at 30, 37% federal. If you're in California, you're paying, what, 15% now, Art? Maybe Thir it's going up to 18%. 13.3% if your taxable income is over a million dollars because you're paying the mental health tax. So we, we pay 1% of all of our taxable income over a million dollars for mental health tax. Yeah, so so you have a pretty high effective tax rate, and maybe yeah. maybe yep. your tax rate is going to go up uh, next year, depending on what Congress and Senate and the President do um, in 2021. But here's the here's the deal: it's that dollar in your pocket is worth way more today than 39 years from now. And so what what a cost segregation study is, and it's completely respected by the IRS. Um, you have this booklet that a team will provide you for whoever you hire. I, Bailey, provides this service. We have a team of, gosh, I think 40 folks now internally where this is all they do along with energy credit studies and so forth. Um, but there's also other firms out there that do a great job as well performing cost segregation studies. So you get a booklet that you know, lays out, all right, here's, here's the breakdown of the wiring that goes into the building, um, the HVAC and so forth. And it's connected to these chairs, which uh, it's uh, shorter your life for this. Uh, this operatory is a, a five-year asset, seven-year asset, or so forth. So, if we can get the cost of that building and break it up into buckets, and we can get that cost into shorter life buckets, well, a five-year asset you can use 100% bonus depreciation that Art and I were just talking about. And so if you use that 100% bonus depreciation on those five and seven and 15 year assets, and you pull that cost into those shorter life assets, you can get that deduction in the year you purchase it. So if it's a million dollar purchase, I think a rule of thumb is it's probably about a 30% portion of that million dollar purchase yeah. that you can, yeah. that 20 you can to 30% is about what I yeah. use. Yeah that you can pull into those uh, shorter life buckets and expense in the year uh, of the building acquisition. So if you make that purchase this year, I mean, shoot, after allocation of the land, you might have uh, $250,000 that you can write off against your, your practice income. Um, another great way to capture some of that QBI deduction too, um, if you really have a, a profitable practice. Yeah, and, and, and the thing is, is that uh, this deduction is actually available if you built an office back as far back, folks, as 1987. Now, if you built an office in 87, most of it's depreciated, so you're not going to get much of your bang for your buck. But, you know, you built an office out in the last five or 10 years, and, you know, let's say you're spending, um, you know, $390,000 on these improvements. Um, you know, that's $10,000 a year of depreciation. Mm -hmm. So maybe you've taken $100,000. Well, if I could move, you know, $200,000 of that, you know, or 100, 100, 150,000 of that 390 
into, you know, write off a bowl, a deductible um, expenses, you can take a one-time deduction, right, Scott? We can go back and right. uh, file a form, you know, to, to get them a deduction and they can get a one-time deduction in, in whatever year. And you can pick the year you want. I mean, you may not want that this year. You may say, you know what? I'm, I'm gearing up for 2021. I'm going to have a killer 2021. That's when I'm going to need it. So let's do it then. And we can pick and choose when we do that, right? Yeah. Yeah. And it's not just for dental offices and commercial buildings. I mean, say you, you have a, a colleague and you just purchased a large apartment complex right. and it was a big, uh, big acquisition that you're, you're expanding your investments and, and you can look at it for that investment too, where you can, uh, potentially lower your your passive uh, taxable income um, so it, it doesn't just apply to commercial buildings also any kind of any kind of real estate out there you should you should take a serious look at it well mr. Scott uh, unfortunately our time is about at the end time flies when you're having fun I hope you enjoyed uh, talking you know scintillating amazing tax uh, with me I'm only on my fourth bourbon I thought we we're gonna go longer <laughs> Well, I'll tell you what, we're going to have our Academy of Dental CPA <laughs> meeting next fall. And I think it's fall of 2021. Uh, my, my dear, dear friend, Jerry P. Seimer in uh, Lexington, Kentucky. And uh, he said, no, number one, we're going to a bourbon factory. Number two, we are going to an LSU Kentucky game. And one of our member firms is my other dear, dear friend, Robbie Apple and, um, and the Garen folks. Uh, down there in Baton Rouge, who thank thank goodness that storm missed them, um, but um, they've been kind enough to have me out tw- not once but twice to LSU games. First of all, uh, eating in the state of Louisiana is, I mean, you you should have to pay for that privilege. It's that good. I mean, the food is that good. And second of all, those people know how to tailgate. So anyway, that has nothing to do with taxes. But hey, Scott, listen, thank you. Um, one more time, how do we get a hold of you? So my phone number is 970-999-8932, and my email is shaberman at idbailey.com. Uh, feel free to give me a shout or shoot me an email. Happy to happy to catch up and uh, and answer any questions. So thanks for having me, Art. I really appreciate yeah. it. This was yeah, fun today. So hang on the line for a minute. I get some additional information. Again, folks, I want to give out to you. Thank you so much for listening to our podcast. Our listenership has exploded um, we're getting close to number 100 uh, podcast. I think this is in 90 or 91. I will have a surprise for you. I'm still working on it. Surprises take time, folks. Sorry, uh, but we'll let you know. I think we've got something really cool coming up for our 100th episode uh, uh, later this year. Uh, if you want to get a hold of me in my office in Tustin, my number is 657-279-3243. That's 657-279-3243. Email me at Art Wiederman, W-I-E-D-E-R-M-A-N, at uh, gmail.com. Uh, go to our partner, Decisions and Dentistry's website. Um, click on their offer for a um, an annual uh, membership in all of their over 140 CE courses uh, that you can get a very reasonable price. Um, make sure that you check our Ide Bailey website. Check for, um, uh, check for our... Um, uh, all the updates. I mean, we're going to have updates on HHS and PPP. Uh, I mean, they have a marketing department at this firm that just blows my mind what these folks do. It's it's really cool. So they've got everything right up to the date. Uh, they even have, I think, Scott Mel Schwartz. Mel Schwartz is, a, a, we actually have a congressional lobbyist in Washington, don't mm-hmm. we? Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, Mel's out there and, and he's on top of all of the changes and the potential changes. We have a lot of a lot of great talent kind of in our back office who are tracking the changes to PPP and so forth. I know, Art, you did an outstanding job over the last six months being on top of that PPP, but you know, you're know you not the only one now, and uh, yeah. I think you have a lot of folks that you can lean on, and, oh my God, and we're lucky to have these around. It, it's wonderful. And again, folks, please be sure to go on to fundraise.michaeljfox.org. Uh, my good friend Mark Rosen from Rosen Associates out of Boston um, and, and, and go to his, uh, his email is mrosen at rosencpagroup.com. Uh, Mark is sponsoring the virtual New England Parkinson's ride, which is going to be on September the 12th. Please support that. And, and folks, again, 
keep working on your dental practice. You know, you, you are so important, so vital. Uh, FEMA has recognized that you're one of the top uh, professions serving America. It is so important, the work that you do to, to keep people safe, to keep people healthy. Don't give up on your practice. It's hard. Anything that's worthwhile is hard. You've all worked way too hard. And again, my, my saying is, folks, failure is not an option. Well, that's it for this episode of The Art of Dental Finance and Management. Don't forget to tune in on September the 16th. Uh, go to our website, www.idbailey.com forward slash dental RD if you are interested in possibly obtaining a research and development tax credit. We'll help you out with that. Uh, but we got a lot of great and interesting topics coming up down the road. So again, folks, this is Art Wiederman. Thank you so much for listening to my podcast and for all the great support and emails and, and comments you've made. Uh, it is humbling, and I hope I've been able to help you get through these difficult times. So again, that's it for this episode for the uh, of the Art of Dental Finance and Management with Art Wiederman, CPA. Have a wonderful week, and we'll see you next time. Bye-bye. Thank you for listening to today's episode of the Art of Dental Finance and Management podcast. Be sure to subscribe wherever you listen to podcasts so you never miss an episode. The Art of Dental Finance and Management podcast is produced by Ide Bailey in partnership with Art Wiederman, CPA, Decisions in Dentistry Magazine, and the Academy of Dental CPAs. For audience questions and feedback, email Art Wiederman, awiederman at idebailey.com. That's A W I E D E R M A N at E I D E B A I L L Y dot com. Or you may call Art at 657 279 3243.